tell you about the theme. Um, my theme today, as I mentioned before, is we're going to we're going to talk about um, these low speed logistics based applications. So we're going to talk about campuses, for city applications, delivery, um, logistics at airports, things like that. What I'd like to share is some of the things that are going on in the in the world, but it's not a comprehensive view. This is just a snapshot, and hopefully to kind of plant the seed a little bit of of where the potential, you know, the, the potential for autonomy is now, and where we're going, you know, very, sh very shortly, and and uh, so let me get started. Let me pull it down. Um, so as they're pulling up my presentation, let's talk a little bit about whether or not this is real and. If autonomous vehicles are even ready for deployment today. So Chris gave a really nice talk of what they're doing and they're essentially proving that there are applications that are real and the technology is ready for deployment in some areas. So some areas that have been actually deployed for quite a while are agriculture. And we also see um, deployment in um, mining quite a bit. And Chantal, I see that you came on the screen. Are you? Putting the presentation up, it looks like. Okay, excellent. I'll turn off my camera. And we can jump right down to slide 10, if that's okay, Chantal. So I apologize. Sorry about that, everybody. That's the value of practice, right? I didn't I didn't practice popping up my uh, PowerPoint presentation and got blocked. So, so these slides that we're skipping past are just some of the some of the projects that I've worked on in the past. But that's not as interesting as what we want, really want to talk about is the logistics applications. Some of those that are kind of circled in this this collage is you know we see a UAV delivery packages and a couple small delivery robots. So we can go to the next slide please. So as I was mentioning before, you know, as we start to think about what's real, you know, we, we kind of take a look at science fiction. And to me, science fiction plays an interesting role in that it sometimes is very predictive of the future. And, you know, we even think about our smartphones. That was really, I mean, 40, 50 years ago in science fiction, that was even beyond their comp comprehension that we would have this kind of ability to be able to walk around with this computer in our hand that could connect us to the world and we could do video chats and things like that so here's a little picture of pixar's wally and, and disney's vision of a utility robot that collects and compresses and stacks trash it's a, i think it's a legitimate um, application hopefully the world won't look like that at any time but um, it, it's an interesting application and we can go to the next slide And then here's just a kind of a broader view of, again, from the same movie, Wally. -E. But these are all this little utility robots. They clean, they paint, they deliver, and they maintain. Um, and then my question, is this science fiction or is it prediction? We can go to the next one. So these low speed logistics and delivery autonomous vehicles, are they our next, the next generation of robotic heroes? saving time, money, and even lives, and uh, let you be the judge. But I think you know my my thought on it. And go to the next slide, please. And thank you so much, Chantal, for driving. That's super nice of you. So this is just a quick screenshot from Thor Drive. Thor Drive is, in, what I'm gonna do is just kind of quickly just um, go through these, these just to give you a glimpse and hopefully um, spur discussion. So we can we can have an interesting discussion on the back end of this. So Thor Drive is creating autonomous solutions in multiple areas that are around logistics. And, you know, they make the bold statement that the future will be automated. It's going to unlock efficiency, reliability, safety, operational ex excellence, and what's previously unattainable in the business world. And I really think that's interesting in that last statement, that it starts to talk about the economics and the business case and all of the projects that we work on and i didn't really i was a little flustered trying to get my presentation up i didn't really tell you what i do now so stantec generation av what we are we are here to accelerate the planning 
the deployment and the adoption of autonomous vehicles. So we are a consulting firm, but we are creating the tools to help enable deployment of the autonomous vehicles. So I think it, it, it's our way of, of making sure that all of the all of the proper planning and the support work and safety evaluation and risk mitigation and all of that great stuff is done. It's all that backstage um, stuff that's that's necessary to ensure proper, reliable, um, and safe deployment. So that's kind of in a nutshell what we do. We have a pretty we have a robust team of I think world thought leaders and world leaders with experience in autonomous vehicles. I think we've got people that have created the standards for safety in autonomous vehicles. Some of the top engineers that have worked in deployment, more deployments than I think anybody else in the world. And we've worked with great companies like Arigo to help help with projects and things. And I have a couple pictures going forward. So if we can go to the next slide. Let's jump back into airports as Chris was talking about. So here, what Chris was talking about is his his little cart, which I have a picture of a first generation version, is let's, let's think about the business case and the need um, at airports. ULDs, these unit load devices, they are the leading cause of damage to aircraft, about $400 million a year. And in my notes section, I, I do supply the references of where I got this data. And there are about 900,000 of these in global circulation every day, just, just moving throughout the world. And there's an opportunity there for efficiency and safety, as again Chris talked about. So we can go to the next slide. Let's let's look at what a few different companies are, are doing in this space and uh, take a look. So we know all about Arigo now. So this is a this is the earlier generation of of uh, their auto dolly. Really fascinating. It's really revolutionizing. I won't go into this too much more because Chris did such a great job, but big fan of these guys. And what I think is really interesting is their take on it of being able to automate the actual dolly gives them more flexibility and, and more efficiencies. And I think that's really interesting um, in that these things could be, somebody asked if they could be daisy changed. They daisy chained. They absolutely could be for a while, but then they could also break off and go where they need to. That, that provides more flexibility than a tug, which is which I think is interesting. But there are folks that are also working on tugs. So we can go to the next slide. And here's Store Drive again, who provided that quote for us at the beginning. They did a pilot last year with Cincinnati Northern Kentucky Airport. But you see, here's just another version of um, autonomous company working on airside equipment. So, um, you know, used for luggage or ULD transport. We can go to the next one. And I'm gonna start kind of moving through these pretty fast. Um, TLD and Easy Mile it's teamed up to also, also to automate a tug. There's, um, again, same airport applications, but it starts to see, and this again is not a comprehensive view. This is just a snapshot of a few companies. So we can go to the next one. And, and then you start to think about what else could we do with these tugs? And here's an industrial campus that, um, again, that, that Easy Mile with their Tracked Easy product there is working with a manufacturing company. And we, we also start to think about the business case. And they claim that on average, about you know, 18 months to two years, you can see a return on investment for this product. And if, if you think about that, even in these early stages of development and the technology that you can get. ROI that fast because these are only going to come down in prices. The, the sensors become less expensive and we start to see more economies of scale. So pretty impressive that we can we can see an ROI in 24 months in the current technology. We can go to the next one. And another uh, product that could be that is being used actually at airports. This isn't automated but it gives us a glimpse of it, that it could be automated soon. So this is an electric remote controlled uh, pushback device. It's saving a lot of um, time and energy and fuel. And it, we see the little quote that 54% that, uh, reduction in delays at Heathrow Airport, which is really a major cost savings and, and, and uh, economic opportunity when you see those types of um, savings in time in turnaround of the aircraft. But think about those will be automated one of these days. And the next, next slide, please. And please, you know, jump in with questions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna save some time at the end um, to answer questions. So I'd love to, love to chat with everybody. 
But here's another product. This is more air traffic an aircraft tug, it's a taxi bot. Um, it could be remote controlled from the cockpit or it could also um, be automated at some point. But this is again, huge cost savings on moving the aircraft from the gate to the runway. So you don't have to burn fuel. Um, you, you can essentially, you know, you're essentially just burning this electricity in this, in this tug. But they're also finding that there's tremendous um, to, you know, there's advantages in turnaround time. This, this can move the aircraft faster and in a more agile way, which again, that's really more of an advantage for the airlines is turnaround time. We'll go to the next one. Now, the shift gears a little bit. We're going to leave the airport and we're going to start to talk about more consumer based um, products that are, you know, we're talking about delivery players. So this will be in the slide. I won't go through all of them. You know, it's kind of an eye chart anyway, but. I want to thank my friend um, Damien DeClerc from Spring. He's the CEO and founder of the company Spring, and uh, based out of Berlin. And he is he has autonomous delivery robots, and uh, we'll show a picture of that in just a second. But this is a nice, really nice chart that he put together that kind of shows a snapshot right now of most of the the players out there in um, autonomous delivery. So we can go to the next one. And this is the, the spring um, vehicle. It's actually created by a Chinese company, Nilix. And Damien is deploying these throughout Europe, as I mentioned, based in Berlin. We can go to the next slide. And to give you a sense of what these vehicles can do is this is one of the deployments in China that was, this was shown um, just a few months ago is that uh, with a partnership with Kentucky Fried Chicken is that these little delivery robots kind of created um, you know, opportunity for, you know, less human touch. This was kind of a COVID solution last year, but really interesting. But it's essentially the, the same automated delivery vehicles as, as Spring is using in Europe, but shows an interesting use case. We go to the next. And well, I thought this was really interesting. If you think about Neelix, is just where they're going and how fast they're getting there. They are already in mass production with us. So a lot of people don't realize that there are hundreds, if not thousands of these vehicles already made. And there's all types of different configurations. We can go to the next. And this is just a little snapshot of their Gigafactory where they make these. So they are rolling off the line. We can go to the next. I know I'm working you over some help of just, I keep saying next, next, next. So, so let's come back to the U.S. That's what's going to happen in the U.S. and in North America. Um, we want one of the companies that's kind of gotten some good press and they've raised a lot of money is Neuro. So Neuro is doing deliveries uh, primarily in, in California, in the, in the Silicon Valley, San Francisco Bay Area, but a really great company. You can operate in mixed traffic on streets, but a great company. And they have, a, if we're talking about the opportunities and if this is a real thing, um, these guys were valued at about $5 billion um, at the end of last year after this $500 million round was closed. So pretty impressive. We can go to the next. And then we've got the little guys. When I say little guys, not necessarily little companies, but little robots like Starship. Starship is probably the, the has the most robots out there. And they've also hit um, a million autonomous deliveries. So really impressive company. And they're really growing fast. We can go to the next slide and it shows a little bit more of a version of where, where they are with their delivery process. So very interesting. Um, I, I think, you know, there's so much to look at in this thing. You know, they hit their 1 million at the beginning of this year, but showing what the popular products are for delivery, that's really interesting data. But then also showing the savings in CO2 emissions, very important. And a great company on its way for massive growth, but it also shows us that we're ready for this. You know, there's the people and the consumers, they, you know, they like delivery by robot. I, I'm really excited to have it in my area. So we can go to the next. And another small robot company is KiwiBot. They've they've been out deploying. They're a pretty rapid deployment option as well. Great little company. 
um, they're also showing a, a reduction in cost and they have they're on a mission to really lower the cost of delivery you know right now they they claim it's around five to ten dollars per delivery and their mission mission is to get the cost of the delivery under a dollar so can't beat that so that, that's just another advantage of when robots are to scale we will see you know efficiency savings and we'll see um, definitely um, improve it safety but we're all going to see improve, also going to see improved economics and i think that's just an important point to keep reinforcing that's our that's one of our major goals and go to the next slide we're going to keep talking delivery We've got an interesting little company out of michigan pedestrian that works both indoors and outdoors i think their their first deployments are in hospitals doing um, all kinds of different deliveries within the hospital i believe the pharmaceuticals supplies even food but we can go to the next slide and what's kind of interesting about these, and you can click again, I think there's a little bit of mini animation in here, is their prediction of that there's gonna be 300, over 300,000 robots in the next five years, um, helper logistics robots. That's pretty interesting. I thought that was really interesting. I appreciated that, that vision from them. We can go to the next slide. And I just wanted to, and you can click one more time, and I wanted just to bring up this pedestrian is pretty interesting and then they have kind of a two um two formats is they, they have that little autonomous vehicle in the front there that's the real autonomy robot and the thing behind it is essentially a trailer so for the small indoor deliveries they just use that front portion if it's a larger um on the street delivery they can use the whole this whole system so I think it's pretty interesting. And then they also talk about the cost savings, 25 to 35%, um, $85,000 per, per robot in just savings. And they predict um, you know, 10 to 20 robots per hospital. That shows the, mar the market size, which is pretty massive. Okay, we can go to the next. And we've got some more emerging. These are a couple of companies that I'm actually working on pilots with. Um, for different activities like grocery delivery, food delivery. So EVTS has this full electric connected um, vehicle. It's a three-wheeled vehicle. So, you know, it's really legally classified as a motorcycle, but it's a mid-speed vehicle. I think it can go 50 to 60 miles per hour, full electric. They have some really interesting connectivity um, in it um, where you could use, you know, easy integration into fleet management projects and things like that. But they work, they can reconfigure the back end to pretty much be whatever you want. It can be a dump truck, it can be food storage, it can be hot, cold chambers, et cetera. So really interesting little vehicle. Um, then Interplay is a new startup also in Michigan. And they have, they have a number of really interesting things, but I just wanted to give a glimpse of them. They're kind of still in stealth. So, um, but that configuration is really interesting because the, the entire kind of back of that robot comes off and it can be in, instead of loading um, the robot individually with packages, the, the back end essentially is just um, removed and replaced. So it's, it's just a different vision and version of it, but uh, Interplay is a really interesting company. Um, wish I could, I could talk about those guys for an hour. So we can go to the next one. And then we're getting a little bit bigger. You know, I talked about small logistics robots, but we've also got to let's talk about the, the larger versions it's just because this is going to be a massive adoption and a massive opportunity for autonomy. Is that this is usually beyond the sight of most of us of what happens in ports and terminals, but they are going automated. And Singapore, um, it's not the first, but it's going to be one of the most comprehensive autonomous versions of ports and terminals in the world. Um, it's going to be a highly automated um, port terminal when it's finished we go to the next and those were abb and then these are kind of back to some ideas and this this i just i just found this there's a reference there i just thought it was cool because i would love it if my trash cans were automated and could take themselves off to the curb and bring themselves back but i think it, it could be a legitimate application we can go to the next and this is another just a vision concept only don't imply any affiliation with any companies it's just an idea it was an idea is that just the different ways we could use autonomous platform the one on the right there is by pratt and miller that's actually not a concept vehicle that's actually a real vehicle used for 
the military in multiple ways, both for logistics, but also for um, targeting exercises. But they can take that that robotic platform and turn it into many, many things. So that was just kind of a vision. Could it be a, a themed vending machine or the concept there? So it's not real. It's just a cool idea. We go to the next. And I think that kind of that wraps it up. Just this is what we do. I mentioned at the beginning, we, we accelerate automated mobility. We have all of the tools to do that. And that's, there's a list of them. And there's my email if anybody wants to contact me. So we can start with Q&A. So again, I apologize for that slow start. Thank you for the, the folks facilitating being able to save the day. You guys were awesome. And I'll answer some questions. I'll turn my uh, camera back on. Okay, there we go. All right, how do I see AVs actually rolling out? Well, they are actually rolling out already. We, they are, like I mentioned at the beginning, they are um, in mining quite a bit. They're in agriculture. They are being tested and trialed in um, uh, transit applications, full-size buses, shuttles, and small carts. And then all of these utility projects that I showed, um, almost, almost all of those are real. I mean, the delivery robots, they're happening. So um, they're already out there on the streets. It's going to take a while to, full, to see full adoption and scale, but um, there's enough of us working on it where I think we're going to see in the next five years, it's not gonna be uncommon to see delivery robots on the streets and on the sidewalks. What are my thoughts on the cities need to be doing now to support this type of development and adoption? It's a great question. Um, you need to create a plan. First of all, we need to confirm that you have the policy in place to be able to facilitate this. You need to um, create a plan that's affiliated or associated with your master plan. And some people are ready to go now and we can start the planning for an autonomous vehicle deployment. Others are just learning. So you can, you can train your staff, you can do visioning, and then we can do full road mapping to, to, towards deployment. A phased approach is always the best. Let's start small and slow and work our way to the to the big stuff because it's also necessary because the technology is not fully ready yet in most cases at least for not full de public deployment on public streets there are a couple a few companies that are ready but not many yet but they will be soon in the next two to three years we're going to see more and more coming online with commercial applications so anyway that was a long answer to say what you really need to do is educate your team and start the planning process do i think that Connected V2X and the lesser extent DSRC will play a role in vehicle automated vehicle adoption. Yes, I'm trying to think of the, the word adoption, but it's it's just uh, it's a given. Um, connect automated, in my opinion, automated vehicles are connected vehicles. So um, whether it's 5G or DSRC or whatever the solution is, it's an absolute yes. It's it's essential for the redundant safety system. Um, and, and it also supports fleet management and uh, you know human in the loop for remote supervision. The technology for CAVs looks relatively mature. Can you speak to the challenges implementing these products and solutions in real world cities and municipal environments? Yeah, there's there's a lot of challenges um, because it's actually they're not that mature yet. So what you have really have to do is make sure you understand all of the risks and put in the proper safety protocols, safety verifications, and these are all of those kind of things I've mentioned that are the non-sexy backstage things that are necessary for, for deployment. You have to understand what the capabilities of the autonomous vehicles are and choose the right applications. And then also look at how we can scale and graduate. So essentially these are, some of these have to be deployed with some level of constraint. You know, think of those training wheels and we can, we can go further and faster as we prove it, the safety and the reliability. So those are the things that we work on all the time. And um, some of the, the challenges are some people deploy the autonomous vehicles in ways that they're just not ready for yet. Um, you know, and some of the companies are, are to blame on that as well. And this, that, you know, a lot of us who are fans of the technology, sometimes we, we're moving a little bit fast. And some of the companies that are developers, um, have overpromised in the in the past, and they didn't quite live up to the promises. And there hasn't been any major safety issues, but there has been efficiency issues and cost issues. So I think just a good, great planning process is, is the key. You mentioned one of the Pratt and Miller vehicles being used by the military. How much of a role do you 
uh, vision, plane, and military applications. Oh, the military is one of the biggest users. Um, last year, the company Robotic Research just went public, I think third or fourth quarter of last year, that they've delivered over 100 autonomous trucks to the military. So the, the military is still going to be one of the front runners in autonomous development and deployment. And, um, and then as more and more applications come online, things like transit applications, shared mode transportation applications, utility applications like logistics, inspection, security, all of those will, if they, if they work in a city, they'll likely work on a military base. So there's, there's a lot there. Given the very small payload, do you think sidewalk delivery robots like Starships will actually make a difference or is it more of a novelty and a gimmick for now? Good question. Great question. Um, I'm not sure if I really know. I, I think that I think all of these kind of um, purpose built vehicles and autonomous vehicles have a place and we will find out, you know, based on just market demand, um, what's going to make sense where. So I think they're going to have a place. We'll just see where and, and how. You know, and, uh, you know, maybe those are going to be perfect for college campuses. And that's essentially where they stay. There are college campuses and urban centers. And maybe that's it. But that's OK. You know, there's plenty of those out there. But but interesting. Good, good question. OK, interoperability for these amazing AV technologies offered by different companies. Um, another great question. You know, we need interoperability from the connected vehicle side for sure. Um, we need to be able to share data, um, you know, in this new connected environment. When we have different suppliers operating different fleets around the world, they still these fleets and the humans controlling the fleet need to be able to communicate effectively. So I think that's that's really important, and that's the key that we need to make sure that we're we're working that towards that. And I've never seen any pushback. There's never been anybody saying no. I don't. Uh, I'm I'm opposed to that. So I, I think that's where we're going anyway. It's it's a very collaborative. Um, environment when we're talking about scaling deployment. All right. Some experts believe deep learning AI will never be able to reach level five autonomy, which is not possible in the real world. Can you please comment on level five? Um, that's a great question. You know, I don't have a strong opinion about level five because I think level four gets 90 five percent of the job done maybe even 99 percent of the job done i mean the level four constraints could simply just be speed and geography um and if we have any constraints then it's level four so if i limit the speed of the vehicle um to 45 miles per hour 25 miles per hour because of the environment that it's in now it's level four if i only let it operate in this this neighborhood or this downtown area it's level four so won't that cover us in most applications? You know, um, full level five, I want to go from my house in Michigan or Florida, and and I want to go to California and just sit back and take naps, you know, that being fully level five. I think that's going to be possible. But is it again, is it going to be considered level four or level five? So I probably didn't give you a great answer, but uh, it's... It, um, it's kind of how I feel about it. I think level four is going to cover us most of the time, almost all the time. We covered various AV use cases applications. What's a common and how mature is regulatory framework in the U.S. and Canada? Great question. And I think how mature is it? Um, I mean, it's, we're kind of in our infancy still in every sense in the deployment of this technology, the development of the technology, and part of that deployment is regulatory. So we're still very new and young. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. How I would rate the maturity, I'm not really sure. I'm not an expert. What I love is that on our team, we have one of the leading experts in North America, and I lean on him to, to help us with those conversations and that work. So um, I'm a business guy and a tech guy, and our regulatory <laughs> team, are they're amazing, and they keep me informed, but they're really the experts. What, in my view, will be the impact of 5G on the deployment? And which use cases, where does that matter the most? Um, it's going to have pretty big impact. And one, being able to be in a connected environment is critical for safety and, and just efficient operations. But also 5G is going to enable more data transfer. And the more data 
that we can use and transfer and evaluate, and analyze, the better it's going to be. So it's going to be, I think it's going to be a pretty high impact. More data, the better, right? And you know, more efficient and safer. All right, I appreciate it so 